Hello and uh, welcome. Thank you for joining the webinar today on our recently launched report entitled Ensuring Economic Viability and Sustainability of Coffee Production. Um, I'm Nicholas Menling, one of the co-authors of the report at the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment and will uh, do my best to moderate today's webinar. Um, I'm joined today by Juan Esteban Orduz, the president of the Colombian Coffee Growers Federation, which was one of the main sponsors of the study. Juan coordinated the project um, for the World Coffee Producers Forum, and with his year-long experience and connections in the coffee industry, he was instrumental for the project. Um, I'm also joined by Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who is a renowned economics professor, bestseller author, and global leader in sustainable development. He's the director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and long-term advisor to the United Nations on the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals and more recently the Sustainable Development Goals. And Professor Jeffrey Sachs has been leading on this project. Um, also joined today is James Rising from the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. He's at the London School of Economics where he studies and the models the feedback between environmental and human systems and focuses on the impacts of climate change and the water energy food nexus. Um, he's been responsible for the econometric side um, of, the, of the analysis and climate change component. Um, so just to provide a bit of context um, before getting started, this report was commissioned by the World Coffee Producers Forum in 2018 with the aim to one, understand better the drivers and um, that have led to low coffee prices in recent years, to model future prices based on expected trends with particular focus on climate change, um, and providing suggestions of how to achieve sustainability in the coffee sector based on the assessment um, of the components outlined above and in light of technological advances. So during the past year, we've interviewed more than 80 experts in the coffee sector for the purpose of the report, held a number of consultations during major coffee sustainability events, and incorporated extensive feedback from various stakeholders. Um, but we very much welcome additional feedback on the ideas presented, as this is only the start uh, and going for ongoing effort to achieve sustainability in, in the world's favorite beverage industry. Um, just a word on the process before handing over to Juan. We'll start, start off by Juan um, giving a short intervention um, to frame the discussion. Then we'll hand over to Professor Jeffrey Sachs to explain the results of the study with James Rising adding anything on the modeling and climate change side. And then we'll move on to the Q&A session um, where you can ask questions and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, you will see or you should see on your screen an option on, uh, with a questions tab. So if you can write in your questions there, um, then we'll be able to read them and answer as many of them as, as we can. Um, please submit those throughout um, the webinar. Um, so you can start um, you know, anytime. You don't have to wait for the Q&A session. So we can start sorting them and, and uh, trying to do our best at, at answering that. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Juan. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Nick. Uh, my name is uh, Juan Esteban Ordoz. I'm uh, representing the Colombian Coffee Growers Federation of America. Uh, if someone had made a survey among, uh, among uh, coffee consumers in, uh, in consuming countries, of course, uh, mostly developed countries, uh, about what they believe is a sustainable coffee, uh, most of them would answer you, would tell you, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, the environment, it's uh, the flora, it's the fauna, it's uh, social indicators, it's child labor, it's gender equity, uh, and, uh, and, those, and those issues. However, only few of them would answer you that, economic, that sustainability includes economic sustainability, which is basically the income of the farmers. No one really asks, is the farmer, can the farmer make a living? And feed his or her family with what they make uh, with uh, with coffee, and that's one of the biggest one of the biggest uh, uh, questions that that Professor Sachs and his team have been working on, uh, and how to uh, if you should know how to solve that issue. Uh, about twelve and a half million families live of coffee, produce coffee in the world, so that's about sixty million people, and uh, and uh, in many and most of them are smallholders, and in, and many of them are having very difficult timing, in, in some cases even starving, because they cannot 
even cover the production production costs at the current prices. And that's one of the of the huge uh, of the huge issues that that of the huge challenges that the coffee the coffee value chain faces. In 2015, uh, we were sitting in Costa Rica with our CEO Roberto Vélez and some other some other uh, coffee production uh, countries leaders discussing uh, what about the challenges that we all face and which are basically the same. Uh, if you go to if you go to Colombia, you go to to many places in Brazil. You go to Uganda, you go to Costa Rica, or you go to Guatemala or India. The problems are basically the same. However, we also realized that we never, when, when those problems are discussed, those pro problems are discussed, they are never discussed from the producer's perspective, mostly from the uh, industry perspective, because we never got together, producers. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, so we decided in, in that, in that uh, frame, we said, okay, we should we should get together and we should start an open dialogue with the whole value chain, but from the producers, from the farmers' perspective, not just from the from the rest of the of the value chain. Uh, that was uh, late 2015 in Costa Rica. Afterwards, we met with our Asian and African peers in Ethiopia in early 2016, and uh, and uh, after that, uh, uh, those discussions in in uh, in Ethiopia. We ended up concluding that we needed to gather together, to get together uh, soon, which we did in Colombia in Medellin in 2017, um, and uh, in what we call the World Coffee Producers Forum at the time, the world first World Coffee Producers Forum. For that forum, we did we, under, we understand that that the the questions about sustain, economic sustainability and sustainability as a whole uh, is a very complicated one. Oh, there are many questions there. Complicated. There are no black and white answers. So that's when we invited Professor Sachs to come in and be the keynote speaker in uh, at the first coffee producer forum, uh, the first World Coffee Producer Forum. And why? Because we thought it was very important that that an expert, independent expert, internationally recognized, uh, that that is a leader in uh, in sustainability globally, could frame this conversation, the coffee conversation, in a way that we could try to advance and have a productive discussion among us the uh, the uh, among the, the the coffee the coffee producer uh, let me call it he was a kind of a uh, to some extent like a, an honest conceptual honest broker uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, between, between, among all the players of the of the value chain so after that uh, that uh, intervention of professor Sachs, which everybody everybody found very very interesting and very enlightening on uh, on the future in terms of sustainability, the future of the of the coffee value chain, uh, we decided to start working with him and with uh, with uh, the, his team at CCSI on on uh, doing a study uh, on uh, asking them to do to make a study of the sustainability of coffee production and in the end of the whole coffee sector. And this is this took uh, took uh, uh, more than a year. Uh, it was a very very thorough work, uh, and uh, uh, of which the Preliminary, preliminary conclusions were presented in the second World Coffee Producers Forum in Campinas in Brazil last July. With the feedback of the of the uh, of uh, the producers gathered in Brazil, uh, Professor Sachs and his team finished the report, uh, which was launched on October first, uh, the International Coffee Day, in fact. Uh, and uh, and uh, and this is what the, the the report we're discussing. We understand. As, uh, as producers and uh, and uh, and I guess the whole value chain should understand that but we need to have a corresponsible approach to the challenges uh, of the coffee value chain. Corresponsible means basically that every single link of the chain should be should be working for the health and wealth of every other link. The whole chain should be positive, but every single link should be positive uh, too, not just the the whole uh, the whole link. Uh, the, this uh, this uh, uh, work of the of the producers and the producers forums, together with Professor Sachs, I, th I believe that has changed the uh, the uh, what I call the global coffee dialogue, uh, because because now uh, from being in the back burner, basically the uh, the economic sustainability has come to the jump to the spotlight together with uh, with environmental and social sustainabilities. Uh, if one can talk talk about three sustainabilities. Uh, and uh, and is and everybody is trying to find ways to make 
coffee production, coffee production more sustainable. The uh, the uh, one of the of the uh, of the producers gave me a, a sentence uh, some a year and a half ago or so in Brazil uh, that that I think is very very graphic of what's happening. And he said that you know in the end poverty is the biggest predator of communities and of the environment. And that's something we should all keep in mind that no matter what happens with the market, and some say the market is the market. If you have people starving uh, down the, the, the part of the of the market. Uh, one should do something, and we need to we need to work on making producers uh, sustainable, and hence the whole value chain sustainable. Uh, so, so this is kind of the 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 background of of how this uh, report came to be. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Sachs and his team at CCSI for all the work they've been doing, uh, which is very hard talking to everybody in the coffee value chain. And uh, Professor Sachs, the the floor is yours. Welcome, and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Juan, <clears throat> and uh, thanks to everybody. We're really happy that we have had this opportunity to uh, participate with this uh, wonderful industry and this uh, <clears throat> wonderful beverage, <laughs> which is uh, indeed uh, the world's most beloved beverage. And uh, we would like to see it indeed uh, be sustainable. And for the 60 million uh, plus people in the coffee value chain to be able to make a decent living in a sustainable manner from coffee. The challenge uh, we have is uh, really uh, twofold. One is uh, that world prices are very, very low in real terms for uh, farmers in most parts of the world, uh, making it very hard to earn a, a basic decent livelihood right now and the second challenge is that the environmental crisis uh, facing the world especially global warming is intensifying and this will have its impacts on the coffee sector as well so we went out to try to understand uh, the nature of the low prices what could be done about them what kind of options exist and the challenges of climate change, which will continue to worsen uh, in the coming decades and the implications of that for the coffee sector. Uh, I'm going to show you some of those uh, conclusions. Let me stress that uh, all of this work uh, uh, is uh, subject to discussion, revision uh, as a more data and more insights come in there are puzzles to be sure but we feel in this report uh, that there is a basic uh, story that makes sense and that uh, behooves the industry to uh, address because there really are serious challenges about the sustainability of livelihoods and the environmental sustainability facing the sector so let me put up a very brief PowerPoint presentation to walk through some of uh, these themes. And uh, I hope you can see uh, that presentation. Uh, and if so, uh, I'll start out here just to uh, explain the basics of uh, coffee pricing right now. Uh, what you see here is a graph that shows the inflation-adjusted international price of coffee, uh, that is, uh, in this case, uh, the International Coffee Organization category mild Arabica, from 1960 and here until the end of 2018. So it doesn't cover the most recent months. But the main point of this is the fact that there was a basic break in the performance in the nature of world coffee prices with the collapse of the coffee agreement in 1989. Between 1960s uh, till 1989, prices were supported by a coffee agreement that included supply side restrictions, especially in Brazil, the world's major producer of Arabica, that held prices high or relatively high. Of course, uh, that's shown by the 
average price at around uh, four dollars a pound uh, in 2018 dollars from 1960 to 1989. That agreement collapsed, of course, as everybody knows, uh, roughly 30 years ago. And uh, it collapsed mainly because uh, the Brazilian coffee growers said uh, that they did not want to restrict supply any longer to hold up a global price. And after the collapse of the agreement, prices were determined mostly through market forces of supply and demand with producers in every country responding to those prices. What ensued was a much, much lower real price of coffee under $2 per pound that was also fairly uh, uh, without trend, fairly much without trend from 1991 until uh, at least uh, the end of 2018. In both periods, there were uh, lots of uh, ups and downs of the coffee price, uh, depending on world uh, market conditions, weather patterns uh, in Brazil, fluctuations uh, in world interest rates, uh, oil prices, and so on, and the value of the US dollar and the value of the British, uh, of the Brazilian currency. But I think it's right to say that basically, uh, these fluctuations, although very dramatic year to year, were without long-term trends. So in fact, since 1990 or so, prices have been relatively low. Uh, now, during that time, some important costs have risen. Uh, so uh, even with those uh, low prices, which may have been tolerable for farmers at the beginning of the period, it becomes a, a real squeeze for farmers later. More recently, there has been a further decline of prices in the last 18 months, uh, and they're very low today, under $1 uh, per pound for the ICO composite price, and about $1.30 per pound for the ICO Arabica index. These really are 25% or so lower than the average during 1991 to 2018. Now, oh, I'm trying to move this forward. Hold on, there we go. Uh, one of the factors that moves the world coffee price in the shorter term is uh, currency uh, fluctuations. When the dollar is strong, the dollar price of coffee tends to be weaker. When the Brazilian currency is strong, also that would weaken uh, the or lower the dollar price of coffee. And when the Brazilian real is lower in real terms, uh, that would tend to uh, reduce the world price of, uh, of coffee. So there are, in addition to that, the long-term uh, basically low average price since 1991, currency fluctuations that today are having an effect. The dollar is relatively strong. The Brazilian currency is relatively depreciated because of the economic crisis and political crisis in Brazil. And because of that, uh, that probably has knocked off uh, maybe 20% uh, off the average price of Arabica coffee worldwide. It doesn't explain all of the recent decline, but it explains some of it. Now, what is more dramatic is the fact that uh, there is a huge discrepancy in global coffee production now in the productivity achieved by Brazil in Arabica and I would add by Vietnam in Robusta, with Vietnam becoming uh, the second largest coffee producer in the world, in both Brazil and Vietnam, there have been significant increases in yields of uh, coffee uh, production per hectare. Uh, this is shown in this graph. 
But in the other producing countries, uh, strikingly, there has been no increase of productivity. What this means is that Brazilian producers are making money, not all of them, but uh, a significant part of the industry can earn a profit even at the current low prices, while producers in other regions of the world are basically being choked by these prices because their productivity has not increased. I think everybody knows that Brazilian production is significantly mechanized. It's uh, probably the only major mechanization of coffee in the world. The uh, topography of the coffee growing region is favorable. It's flat, it's not uh, high in the mountains, uh, and it enables uh, machinery for uh, coffee harvesting, for example. And that has made, together with other scientific practices of uh, crop varieties and more intensive inputs of water and fertilizers, a basis for a significant rise of Brazilian productivity. So I think what one can say is that supply and demand is driving the uh, low prices. Uh, and the main reason why supply is able to uh, continue to expand at these low world prices is Brazil. Uh, or if you take Arabica and Robusta together, it is Brazil and Vietnam that are the main drivers of the supply side in the world. And the main reason why even as world demand for coffee grows, the prices remain low or even declining. Brazil and Vietnam now account for roughly half of world coffee production. It's rather stunning. Of course, Brazil has long been a major player. It was by itself more than half of world production 50 years ago, but it declined in the share of Arabica production. But since uh, the 1980s has increased once again uh, in the share of world Arabica production. Vietnam, of course, started from almost negligible uh, production in the 1980s and became the second largest coffee grower in the world, and not just in amount, but uh, in uh, a strikingly high productivity, tons per hectare of coffee. So this is the most fundamental reason for the low prices, producing roughly half of the world output on about 25%, 22 to 25% of the hectares that are planted, that implies a yield that is twice the world average. Uh, and uh, this, I think, helps to account for uh, the low prices. It's the most important factor. Indeed, one should uh, realize that Brazil's planted area is actually much below the peak. So Brazil has achieved the increase of production while actually uh, leaving some of the traditional coffee lands aside or converting them uh, to production of uh, other crops. That by itself is very important because it means that Brazil could expand coffee production probably uh, quite significantly without uh, even having to go outside of, exist of uh, previously uh, farmed coffee areas. In other words, there's a lot of land available in Brazil for further expansion of coffee. And given the high productivity of uh, Brazil's coffee production, it suggests to me that it's very unlikely that market forces alone are going to push higher the world market prices. It is striking that Brazil and Vietnam account for 83% of the increase in global production since 1995. That shows you uh, the significance of the productivity increases in those two countries in explaining the dynamics of the world coffee market. Now, oops.
Let's look on the roaster retailer side, uh, the buyers that then sell on to the final consumers, especially in the developed countries. The most important phenomenon on the roaster retailer side is the increasing concentration and therefore market power of a few of the large roaster retailers. Of course, Nestle is by far the world's dominant a company in the coffee sector, but JAB Holdings, as uh, everybody knows, has bought up a large number of major brands uh, and has become the second largest uh, player in the coffee sector. And just two companies now, Nestle and JAB, account for 40% or more of the market share of retailed coffee. Now, in, in the uh, high income, non-coffee growing countries, I should say. And this also has an implication. It probably means that uh, these companies are using their market power at least to an extent in uh, being able to reduce the uh, prices received by farmers in the coffee growing countries. We could not determine how much market power was at play, but I would guess, and it's a guess, uh, that uh, the increasing uh, concentration in the retailer side of the industry has contributed to the recent decline of coffee prices worldwide. Basic conclusion, the main driver of low coffee prices is on the supply side, uh, the vast uh, increases of production in Brazil and in Vietnam. They have prospects for even further increases. Their productivity is high. Uh, that keeps the prices and world markets low. But it's probably the case also that the uh, market power of a few big buyers also contributes to the lower prices. Now, the big buyers, of course, uh, have as their main assets, uh, not their market power per se, but their brand. Uh, and uh, everybody knows that uh, the price markup of coffee in the retail segment, whether it's in coffee shops or on storefront shelves, is absolutely remarkable. Uh, a Starbucks, uh, down the block from me here in New York City uh, costs uh, $2 or more per cup, but the coffee uh, content of that is uh, between one and two cents uh, per cup. Some of it, of course, is the rent and, the, uh, and, and uh, the shop services, but a lot of it is just the brand name, uh, the, the branding uh, alongside this. So in the coffee supply chain, Coffee prices are low because the raw material is low, but coffee prices to the retail market can be very high in part because of the intangibles of uh, a brand name and reputational uh, effects and, uh, and uh, consumer loyalty to particular brands. The upshot of all of this is that with low coffee prices, much of the industry in dozens of countries is struggling. Uh, income levels are low, and there are many, many signs of increased stress, uh, unsustainability from a social point of view and from an income point of view of smallholder coffee producers. Not so much in Brazil, though, because of the higher productivity. Not so much in Vietnam because of the higher productivity but across Africa, across Central America, uh, across other major producing uh, countries, smallholders are greatly stressed by Arabica prices of $1.30 or $1.50 or composite prices uh, close to a dollar or even under a dollar if you take an average of Arabica and Robusta today.
Now, let me add on one more quick point, and that is that there will be more stress to come because with global warming, uh, the likelihood is that productivity will be hit uh, in most places in the world. Uh, warmer temperatures, according to crop modeling uh, and direct evidence, uh, suggests uh, stress on uh, coffee yields uh, and therefore even more difficulties. I think our conclusion overall is that the continued concentration of coffee in Brazil and in Vietnam would likely continue into the future uh, with the disproportionate share of coffee increased production coming from just those two countries unless we are able to overcome the problem of low uh, productivity in the rest of the coffee growing regions and face up to the challenge of global uh, warming, which is going to create uh, more uh, difficulties uh, across the world. So we call on the industry to uh, take affirmative actions to preserve the varieties uh, and uh, the country uh, origins, uh, because these will otherwise be under tremendous stress if we continue as business as usual. And our supposition based on the evidence is that other countries could also increase productivity output per hectare significantly most likely with improved inputs, uh, with more scientific methods, uh, with the water control and so forth, and that they will have to do so in fact uh, if these uh, other origins will remain viable in the years ahead. Uh, they're going to have to compete at fairly low prices, and uh, that means uh, that they're going to have to raise productivity in order to do so. Another option which I should mention uh, at this point is to break into retailing. Uh, this has uh, always been a goal never been easy in this world for producing countries to break directly into retailing uh, in the high <laughs> income world. It's not impossible. In fact, it is probably easier uh, than has been the case uh, up until now because of the rise of e-commerce. So one additional possibility is for producers to uh, be able to obtain a larger share of the global value chain by becoming a direct roaster retailers for the high income market rather than selling beans to uh, Nestle and to JAB. So this is something that we definitely recommend actively exploring, especially using e-commerce as a vehicle for entering uh, the downstream part of the coffee market. Now, we note that not only will there be a crisis of origins, but there will be a human crisis as well. And it's not a future possibility, it's a present reality uh, with the major coffee growing crisis in Central America already leading to mass migration, attempts to uh, move to the US. And that of course has created its own geopolitical crisis in the Western Hemisphere because the Trump administration is not accepting those migrants. So we call for uh, a concerted industry-wide response to the sustainability challenge, but a response not only by industry, but also by governments, by UN agencies, and by international donors. In fact, it is the essence of our uh, report to say that uh, business as usual is not acceptable. It will lead to too much poverty. It will lead to uh, a collapse of production in many uh, sectors uh, and countries that have been a long-standing part of uh, the global uh, coffee sector. 
and it would put added risks on a concentration of supply from just a handful of countries, which the industry shouldn't want and the world certainly doesn't want. We don't want to lose the variety of origins or the loss of biodiversity of, of, of these crops. We want to make countries viable to continue their production. And to do that, we advocate that the industry increase investments to achieve sustainable development and notably to achieve the 17 sustainable development goals. What that means is not only achieving sustainable coffee growing, which is a part of sustainable agriculture, SDG2, but achieving sustainable living conditions for coffee growing regions, which includes healthcare, SDG3, uh, education, SDG4, ending poverty, SDG1, basic infrastructure, water uh, and sanitation, SDG6, electrification, SDG7, and so forth. So the Sustainable Development Goals give a roadmap for every part of the world economy, but also including the coffee sector. And our recommendation is that every coffee growing region in the world should be SDG aligned, should be achieving the social, economic, and environmental goals that are globally agreed as part of the Sustainable Development Goals. What we call for is investment in order to do that. Partly it's investment in productivity of coffee growing itself. That is better seed varieties, more uh, use of uh, appropriate fertilizers, uh, more irrigation and water management, uh, better uh, logistics and supply chains. And partly it's investment in the environment uh, or I should say the infrastructure of the coffee growing region uh, and social services, healthcare, education, uh, transport, uh, water and sanitation, renewable energy, and so forth. And where would this funding come from? In our recommendation, it comes from within the industry and in a complementary way by governments, donors and international organizations, the UN. In other words, we want a partnership to align the coffee growing sector, such an important sector for the world, with the SDGs. In order for this to be credible, we need industry itself to step up, not with its commercial only investments, but also with investments uh, that are based on its social responsibility for the SDGs. So we're calling on Nestle, uh, we're calling on JAB Holdings, and we're calling on other major roaster retailers to put money into a global coffee fund that would help to fund sustainability in the coffee sector. And we're calling for complementary funding from the host governments of coffee growing regions, donor governments of coffee consuming countries and UN agencies. We want a partnership that is four ways. Now, how would the money be used? The money would be used to support coffee sustainability plans within each coffee growing country. So our main recommendation is national plans to raise productivity and to achieve sustainability that then get funded by four complementary sources, a global coffee fund that the industry establishes, government, donors, uh, international donors, and of course, regular commercial investment itself. And the goals would be social protection, higher productivity, improved access to basic services, and uh, climate insurance as well in the face of major risks. We describe in the report how a global coffee fund could be governed, how it could actually operate, and why it is a realistic proposition. Let me end here uh, just noting 
that right now the industry is at risk. Uh, the low prices are not going to revert, we think, anytime soon. They're certainly not going to stay or get much higher for the long term. And therefore, what is needed is the productivity to be profitable, to have a good livelihood within these prices in the future. This is feasible. Most countries of the world need to step up the quality of their production. That requires investment. That requires the kind of complementary strategy that we have called upon. And it requires creativity as well in becoming more a part of the downstream value chain. Well, thank you very much. It's just a quick uh, summary of a report that we hope you will look at. You can find it online. You can see on the slide uh, the uh, lead authors of the report, and we very much uh, welcome your feedback on it. Let me turn it back over to you, Nick. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Um, James, do you have anything you want to add um, on your side or should we jump into the q and I'll just make two short uh, comments just to highlight a couple of the things that Professor Sachs mentioned. Um, we think that there are incredible opportunities to increase yields across uh, much of the rest of the coffee growing world and in particular for small farmers. Um, the total uh, additional production just from um, renovating smallholder fields would easily be on the order of an additional uh, the an additional amount on par with the production of Colombia for Arabica and and maybe on the production of Indonesia uh, for Robusta. Um, but these uh, smallholders cannot do it on their own with the squeezing of the low prices. Um, in many cases, they're not, they are already not investing in the ways that they need to to maintain their coffee orchards. And this is going to result uh, in decreases in their productivity over a, a fairly short amount of time. Um, and behind all of this, demand is going to continue to increase, particularly in coffee producing regions. And so there are really great opportunities uh, if investments can be made to help smallholders to meet that demand and to take uh, a, uh, advantage of really some, uh, some great opportunities in, um, in being able to sell to uh, the world and, and to their local communities. Great, thanks a lot. So there are questions that have come in and I'm, I'll try and group them a little bit um, because there are several ones and that are similar in nature. Uh, one of the questions is related to uh, the financial market. I think a question that came up also quite often when we we're doing the report um, on how much the, the financial making market is playing a role in, in the price determination. Jeff? So not That's only the fundamentals, but the, but, but the sea market itself and the volatility around, around that? I think that uh, a starting point is the uh, lack of any uh, long-term trend in coffee prices over a 30-year period when you adjust the coffee prices for inflation. So that uh, lack of trend is probably a reflection of the basic uh, production and demand conditions, supply and demand, rather than uh, anything specific to uh, the financial sector. If there are effects of the C contract or of global financial markets, speculation and so forth, I think that they are short lived rather than uh, fundamental drivers of the lower prices. If the question is whether uh, the current uh, quite low prices of coffee uh, are the result specifically of the nature of the contracts in New York and so forth, I haven't seen any evidence to suggest so. Of course, it's a popular 
target or alleged culprit. But I'm rather skeptical that uh, we're going to see much by just changing the uh, nature of the contract itself. I think we're looking at more fundamental forces. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, second set of questions that came in is how to deal with the competitive nature of uh, you know, small-scale farmers versus large-scale farmers, Brazil versus other countries. Um, how could that play out in practice? How how can that be addressed? Well, I think Brazil has uh, outcompeted uh, most of the rest of the world in Arabica production in in the last 20 years. In that, uh, yields have gone up significantly. Uh, there's been a major effort at mechanization. Uh, seems to me that Brazil is reaping the returns to uh, a sustained uh, investment in the sector, both in agronomic knowledge and in investment uh, in the actual farms themselves. Uh, in much of the rest of the world, coffee production is by very poor smallholders who have not really been backed by government programs of scientific farming who don't have access to investment uh, possibilities for irrigation or uh, varietal improvements or even often uh, fertilizer inputs uh, that would raise yields uh, on a commercial basis. So I think that uh, what has happened with this very significant rise of output in Brazil and in Vietnam, that much of the rest of the world has just been outcompeted. Uh, prices and prices have gone down. And if you don't have productivity increases, the squeeze uh, on uh, costs is very intense. That really is, uh, I don't think, avoidable other than being able to raise uh, quality and yields and uh, participation in the downstream part of the value chain. In other words, uh, other countries are going to have to take competitive actions themselves, uh, either better coffee varieties, better coffee uh, quality, uh, higher yields, uh, or uh, capturing more of the consumer uh, supply chain uh, through uh, branding and direct marketing. The problem is <laughs> all of that requires uh, investment and time, and that's where money is needed. And the smallholders can't provide that money on their own. That's why we're saying that there needs to be what we say is pre-competitive money, that is money not invested by individual companies to specific commercial entities of theirs, but rather money that is uh, given as part of the huge earnings of Nestle and JAB and others into a fund that then can be used to raise the quality and the productivity of the coffee in other countries. Uh, and the sooner the better. Right, thanks. Um, another set of questions came in about existing standards, um, fair trade, um, other types of standards that look at increasing sustainability, um, why they have or haven't worked and why our recommendations would be different to, to those efforts. Well, I think uh, they're not really working uh, because uh, Many of these standards depend on uh, consumers uh, buying the, uh, the label, whether it's fair trade or uh, some other standard, at a higher price uh, and therefore uh, being able to make a transfer uh, back to uh, the farmer suppliers of that coffee. And after 30 years, the participation uh, in uh, such uh, voluntary consumer-based programs is, is quite small. Uh, they've never really penetrated 
the market in a significant way. Many uh, cooperatives are certified uh, as uh, fair trade or sustainable, but don't get any benefit from that because there aren't buyers that are buying it on that basis because there aren't consumers that are consuming uh, on the basis of a fair trade standard. So I think we're really stuck uh, with this kind of voluntary consumer awareness approach. It made a little difference, but it didn't make a large difference. And it's not really growing as a share of the market. We need something more dramatic. We need something that is a bigger scale. And uh, there's no guarantee that what we're calling for will be accepted because we're calling for the consumers in one way or another to make a major transfer back of the huge benefits that they're getting from this sector, the huge profits that the big brands get from selling coffee to make a transfer to ensure sustainability. At least that can be monitored. It is transparent. We can have a fund and we can see, did Nestle put into it? Did JB Holdings put into it? Uh, did other major roasters uh, put into it? Where is Starbucks, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, uh, McDonald's, and other major purchasers of coffee? We want to see their contribution to this fund, which can then transparently be used to uh, finance the scale up of uh, inputs and investments for smallholders in the poorer countries. Great, thanks. Um, now the, the questions are really coming in, um, so I'll have to be a bit more selective given the time. But one question that um, have, has been asked several times is that a lot of these um, suggestions seem to, to seem to go towards increasing supply um, and whether that provides additional pressure on the price um, what 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 to do on the demand side or how to avoid that you know increased supply from farms yeah. worldwide causes uh depreciate or further depreciation of prices i think there are a few things to say about this um first on the demand side the two demand side uh opportunities that seem realistic are to do more a direct e-commerce sales into the final market and so to compete with the roaster retailers to a greater extent in branding and marketing i'm sure that there's some mileage there at least because of uh, e-commerce platforms selling on amazon or others and second uh, of course to stimulate demand in the emerging economies where coffee uh, consumption is attractive but still quite limited and the obvious candidate there by far is china uh, china is a country that's going to drink a lot of coffee but it drinks very little per capita now i expect that it will uh, increase very very significantly its consumption and i think the industry should promote that it's a good beverage and there's going to be a very very significant new market there but at the same time, another point to mention is that even if the non-Brazilian suppliers increase their supply, the effect I think will mainly be to uh, forestall more expansion of Brazilian suppliers rather than deeply to depress the uh, world market price further. The reason I say that is that Brazil's supply of uh, Arabica is quite elastic. That means that uh, it will go up or down without very much change in price, depending on what happens in the rest of the world. So I think that the price will remain relatively uh, within uh, its current level. But whether most of the supply comes from Brazil or comes from the other countries will depend a lot on whether the other countries are able to increase their productivity. So we should operate both on the supply and on the demand side. More demand, 
especially in China and other emerging economies, more direct uh, e-marketing of uh, to capture uh, some of the branded value, uh, and uh, more supply outside of Brazil to ensure a better balance of uh, origins. But at the same time, direct income transfers from the downstream part of the industry, the big profitable part of the industry, to the upstream part of the industry, the smallholder suppliers, through a global coffee fund. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, James, any questions that you picked out that you still want to talk to before we conclude? Thanks. Um, I've been uh, trying to keep up with some of them in the chat, and I think that we're going to need to um, respond to a number of these offline outside of the webinar. Um, it's uh, just to, to um, highlight another piece of the price puzzle for what happens when uh, other producing countries are able to increase their yields. It's certainly the case that um, we see, uh, based on our scenarios, small decreases in global price when other producing countries are able to increase their production. Um, that again is is a consequence of of basic supply and demand, uh, but the benefits outweigh those costs, and we see that both in terms of um, how much of the total share of the market is going to each country and how many varieties are uh, maintained across the world. We we see just a much more diverse market when investment is made into uh, into increasing yields, despite the those somewhat lower prices. Um, we also uh, look at some other scenarios of how demand um, can change in the future in addition to uh, the, the increase in demand from, from China. Um, and I encourage you to, to take a look at some of those because um, there are really a lot of different possibilities that we're um, looking forward at um, in, in, the next in the next coming decades. And so uh, there's a lot of potential for for different outcomes. Thanks a lot, James. Um, Jeff, any last concluding thoughts that you want to give before closing? Uh, just to uh, thank uh, all of the participants. Uh, again, uh, thank uh, the Columbia Coffee Growers Federation for the chance to be part of this wonderful industry and to encourage uh, feedback to us uh, comments, ideas, other approaches uh, that our paper does not consider because we regard this as a work in progress. Juan, any last word? No, I just want to thank you. Thank you all guys. Uh, you, Nick, uh, um, Jeff, of, of course, as leader of the team and uh, and everybody else for the hard work and uh, and uh, let's continue working and, and try to make uh, coffee growers sustainable. Uh, in the near future thank you so much thanks thanks a lot um this has been recorded so we will also make it available afterwards for people that want to share it with their colleagues or um, watch it again as mentioned we'll try and reach out to some of the people that we have managed to address the questions there have been just a few too many to address in this short amount of time um, and uh, yes, please please stay in touch with us. Um, you know, you can reach out to all of us on the CCSI website, um, and also the other um, authors can be reached, and we'll be happy to continue the, the conversation. Thanks a lot, and good night or good morning to some of you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you all.